Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and friends beyond the binary, it's time for the podcaster who tries to, like, sometimes I'd like to distill the essence of a rainy day uh, and, and make it a bedtime. You, see, just get, you could just get back in bed, and uh, even though it's really, like, you know what I mean, distilling the essence of a rainy day where you could just get back in bed and sleep it all away. I don't know if it, it, rhyming helps distill essences. I don't think getting confused does. Uh, but you know what I mean when you say, uh, hey, you like to just relax. It's, uh, the weather outside is uh, mediocre. Uh, but in here with this podcast, uh, there is no weather, actually. Uh, it's just whether or not you're going to fall asleep during the intro of the story. Remember, am I right or am I right? Uh, I'm usually uh, neither. Because uh, it doesn't always make sense. Because it's time for sleep with me podcast. It puts you to sleep, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and friends beyond the binary. It's uh, time for the podcaster made by a podcast. Uh, I think that's what's happening. Is I have a podcast and a podcaster inside my brain. It's time for a podcaster who gets mixed up, and that's one of the things. Uh, I'm here to not just accept, but encourage his internal mix-ups because it's time for Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. And I don't know if you had a chance to listen to the announcement in the feed this morning, uh, but Sleep With Me is now part of uh, Night Vale Presents, uh, the podcast network that brings you shows like Welcome to Night Vale, Alice Isn't Dead, Within the Wires, Conversations with People Who Hate Me, I Only Listen to the Mountain Goats, It Makes a Sound, the orbiting human circus of the air, and uh, pounded in the butt by my own podcast. And you've probably heard me talk about a lot of these shows before. And it's a really, really exciting partnership. It'll help uh, keep Sleep With Me uh, going along into the future. Uh, but it's also a chance uh, for the show to flourish, uh, to really work with encouraging visionary people, but also to be in a position to help give exposure and encouragement to other podcasters, either people coming into podcasting or people developing their voices. So it's a really exciting times at Sleep With Me. And just so you know, nothing about how you change the podcast will change. Uh, you can stay subscribed in whatever app you currently use. And in order to make all that seamless, behind the scenes, we are going to take two episodes off. So our next episode will be out Sunday, April 8th. And that way we can make sure we have everything in the feed. So you just start getting new episodes right as you already consume them uh, starting April 8th. If you haven't had a chance to, check out all the shows on Night Vale Presents and start listening to them. Uh, but I want to thank everybody at Night Vale Presents. I want to thank everybody at PRX. And I want to thank all my listeners uh, because uh, this flourished out of your encouragement and your dedication to the show and knowing your stories about how uh, much you need sleep and how, how the show can help you get that. Uh, and it's kept me dedicated to keeping sleep with me going long into the future and finding ways to keep the show sustainable and keep the show improving. Uh, those are the things that are very, very important to me. Uh, so I want to thank all of you that have listened over these past four years, whether you're new and you're just checking out the show now. Hey, thanks for coming by. Or you've been a longtime listener. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for supporting the show. Uh, thank you for supporting the sponsors. Uh, thank you for spreading the word or reviewing the show. I could not have gotten here without you. And now we're going to keep the show going. Uh, this episode of Sleep With Me is made possible by hard worker Chris Posty Posters in from Sounds Like an Earful Studios, who edited this episode, did the theme music. Uh, Jonathan Mann is on our lullabies. Uh, Scotty, Jennifer, and Kenny are on our, on our, on our artwork. I'm at Dear Scooter on Twitter. Uh, you can listen to the podcast in your smart speakers. You just say, uh, play Sleep With Me podcast. Uh, and you could say play Sleep With Me podcast on TuneIn if it doesn't do it right away. And our listeners have a Facebook group, so I want to thank the moderators over there. Uh, Julie and Jennifer, uh, Sarah, uh, Stacy, Lauren, Keith, and uh, that's it. What do you say we uh, keep the show going? 
Uh, hey, here you go all night tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep. Well, welcome. This is Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. We do it with a bedtime story. All you need to do is get in bed, turn out the lights, and press play. I'm going to do the rest. What I'm going to attempt to do is create a safe place where you could set aside whatever's keeping you awake, whether it's thoughts, or feelings, or physical sensations, uh, the pitter-patter of rain or little feet or dog feet. Uh, I guess dog's feet go pitter-patter. They go pitter-pitter-pitter, pitter-pitter-pitter, pitter-pitter-patter-patter, or pitter-patter-pitter-patter. Or pitter patter, pitter patter. It I guess depends on your dogs, and it could you know you could have a dog that that doesn't have, you know this like a pitter pitter patter or something. I don't know. What was I talking about? Oh, it's the intro of the show. So uh, I'm here to create a safe place where you could set aside whatever's keeping you awake. I'm gonna smooth it out. I'm gonna pat it down. I might do some pittering. Like, can you pitter with your hands, or can you only pat? You can pat. Uh, because you don't say I'm going to patter you. You say I'll, I'll pat you on the back when actually maybe you could. How's it? That, may, that might be a new thing we could come back to, like uh, pittering and pattering without the feet. Uh, let's get the, those words more like more usage already, right? Okay, but I'm going to create a safe place. I'm, I'm right now, but until I introduce these new theories of the language, I'm going to pit, like uh, I'm gonna smooth and pat it down. I'm going to fluff, I'm going to puff, uh, puff it up. Uh, I'm going to try to really earn your trust if you're new here. I'm also going to send my voice across the deep dark night. I'm going to use lulling, soothing, creaky dulcet tones, pointless meanders, it tangents to places people would never even, you say, Why, what, what do we you do? Like, uh, you're going to really, the second half of the intro, you're going to talk about pitter-pattering, huh, Scoots? I don't know, I may be so distracted, I may start talking about it now, Scoots. Are we talking to each other in the third and fourth person, or the second and the third? I don't know, Scoots. It might be the first person and in the eighth person, because there's so many people up there. I got to get back to the first person of podcasting, which is my listener here, excuse me. So uh, I'm going to send my voice across the deep dark night. I'm using lulling, soothing, creaky dulcet tones, all that to uh, take your mind off whatever's keeping you awake, as I kind of said, to keep you company, it, to be your boar friend, your boar bay, your boar cuz, your boar sib, your boar bud, your boar bestie, uh, as we say in the boar bestie, as we say in the people who collect puffy stickers and clip on emoji heads or whatever is the thing nowadays, uh, forever. Yeah, but if you're new, here's the structure show. First uh, four minutes or so of show business. That's how we keep the show and all the archives free. Uh, then there's an intro. Intros are around 12 to 14 minutes, and that's a show within a show. And uh, where I kind of try to explain what the podcast is. Some listeners get ready for bed during the intros. Some listeners skip the intro. Uh, some listeners fall asleep during the intro. So there's different ways to use it. And you can't really lose it, uh, so uh, so that's the intro. It's like kind of like a monologue. I mean, where I, where I try to talk about one thing, how the podcast works, realize I don't quite understand how it works. And then I try to create a metaphor so I'll understand why the podcast works. And then here we are. Uh, so that's the intro. Then there will be a little more business uh, between the intro and the story. And then we'll have a bedtime story. Tonight will be our uh, modular episodic series, uh, which is a, a new thing. It was super advanced, super technology, technologically advanced. Uh, it's a serial delivered episodically in modular format, audio by audio. And that'll be about 45, uh, 50 minutes. And then we'll have some thank yous at the end of the show. So all told, I'll be here for around an hour to keep you company. You're under no pressure to listen, though. Uh, you just kick back. You can kind of listen. Just like if I, just if, uh, you know, if, some, if you're a grandparent, I think that the te- like the, if you said, who loves the pitter-pattering of little feet? Uh, if you said, who loves the pitter-pattering of little feet? You'd say grandparents do. Uh, parents do like four or five days, four or five mornings a year, uh, only, you know, between the hours of 7 a.m. and like 9 a.m. 
and uh, the, 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 the feet probably love the pittering and the pattering. Uh, but let me get, uh, what was I talking about? Okay, so that's the bedtime story. Oh, you don't need to listen to me. I think I was making that clear. Just like it, you, you would kind of listen. I guess that's the thing. The grandparents, they only have to kind of listen to the pitter-pattering of little feet. If you're a parent, you got to say, what's that pitter-pattering of feet doing? Did I just hear, it? did, did I just hear a step? Like, cause then you got to listen for them to move the stepping stool or a chair and you say, okay, I got to get out of bed now and deal with this. Uh, it went from pitter pattering to stool moving. Uh, so, but a grandparent, they could say, oh, those kids are pitter pattering around up there. Oh, I love them so. Uh, good thing their parents are in charge. I wonder what time I'll buy them candy. Uh, if you're listening, kids, that's what like uh, that's what imaginary grandparents are for. Real candy. Uh, sorry, grandparents, I don't mean to put, those, those only the imaginary ones that live in my brain. Okay. So where were, oh, so, oh, you don't need to listen to me. I, I think I said that twice. Uh, and I think I even made it more clear there. So you're under no pressure to listen. You're also under no pressure to fall asleep. I'll be here for about an hour to keep you company and like, uh, be your friend in the deep dark night, to be your companion, to walk at your side, rambling. Uh, going on tangents while you drift off into dreamland. And you can fall asleep at any time. I'll be here the whole time giving it my all because uh, there's uh, some of you out there that can't fall asleep. And I'm going to be here because I am committed to being your boyfriend, to being here for you, uh, to taking your mind off of stuff, to keeping you company. And, you know, to lower the intensity for you. Say, oh, yeah, that's a little bit better, Scoots. Uh, you say, hey, well, here's how you can make pitter-pattering. Just say, hey, put some socks on. That'll that'll lower the pittering and the pattering. But I was thinking about it because, like, usually, as far as I know, that's the only time. Actually, and I, I, I would assume those are words, but, it, it, like, uh, could you use pitter in that game? What's that game called? Words with Friends or Scrabble. And I say this, I said this in another intro. I can't play those games. I have dyslexia, so I can't, but... Uh, I think I could P I T T E R pitter, and I guess it would have, you could say, well, that's one whose career is removing pits uh, or hobby. Yeah, they're a pitter, and also it's you know half of pittering pattering. It's the sound of uh, one one foot hitting the ground uh, in the forest. Uh, the sound of one foot hitting the floor. Without it, can, can there be a pitter without a patter? Uh, can there be a patter without a pitter? I guess you'd say, yeah, Scoots, what do you do for hobbies? So well, I'm a pitter. Uh, yeah, stone fruits. Uh, I, I take them. I spit them. I, you know, I, like, you know, I just I, I eat a, a, a stone fruits and I spit their pits. Uh, only one or two a day. So I don't know if it's a hobby or pastime or just something I do. It's meditative. Uh, pit, pitting. I'm a pitter. Yeah, I'm starting a new, like, I was going to start, I was going to try to re, what happened was, uh, let me tell you this story, so, you know, sit on down and get comfortable about how I became a pitter. Originally, I had envisioned pittering and pattering being a new form of uh, relaxation for people, you know, for, instead of patting someone on the back, you say, well, I'm not going to pat you on the back, I'm going to pitter patter you, which is a bit like, uh, you know, there's those, like, uh, karate chop motions that they do on cartoons. And then there's padding saying, hey, it's going to be okay. I'm here to help you fall asleep. Uh, pittering is pitter pattering, or, or you could just say, I was hoping it would become a thing. Like, and you say, pitter, you know, are you going to pitter me tonight? You say, yeah, sure. It's two fingers your uh, middle finger and your index finger. And you're just pitter pattering, pitter, patter, pitter, patter, left fingers, right fingers. Or you could patter, pitter. And it's really good when it's raining because uh, there's nothing like the pitter-patter of rain while you're pitter-pattering someone. And I, I, but I guess there's this thing called tapping. And they said, that's already a thing, Scoots. You can't. And I said, well, which would you? Th this is just for the back only, though. And uh, like it'd be pitter-pattering. You'd say, hey, uh, I, I, think it, I think it's kind of like, uh, what's the word with a non-romantic, platonic? Uh, you'd say that's very platonic, pitter-pattering. 
uh, just like platonic friends can pat each other on the back, uh, you'd say, well, massage, like, uh, but I could pitter patter, you know, I could give you a little pitter, a little patter. And, you know, a great way to teach soothing. And they said, I, do you know anything about any of that stuff uh, other than, and I said, well, no, I know my, I said, I know I'm sick of the words. I said, I spoke to pitter and patter. And also I thought about anybody that wants to name, anybody that has a pair of pets, uh, name them pitter and patter. I mean, it can't go really, you really can't go wrong. Uh, or if you're thinking about getting a, you know, name your first pet pitter, then you can get a pat, pat, pat patter. And then you'll be the petter. You know, how about that? Pitter patter, you're the petter. Uh, but yeah, so that's not a go. Pitter pattering doesn't become a thing because otherwise it's just very, uh, those words, they need, a, they need a break, man. They Like other than kids running around on the second floor, like Todd, that's it. That's all they have, pitter and patter. I mean, maybe hopefully I could get 10 or 12 people to name their pets after them. But otherwise, it's just when kids are running around, or metaphorically, say, soon you'll be hearing the pitter and patter of little feet. Uh, and the only people that use that is grandparents uh, or people at showers. And I don't know, those words just said, hey, Scoots, how about it? Actually, they paid me a sponsorship fee. This episode's sponsored by the words pitter and patter. Uh, also look it up in a Scrabble dictionary, make sure we can use those words. Uh, I don't think they use any unique, uh, P I T T E R patter. Yeah, probably. I mean, you get, at least you get two T's in there, uh, either way. Uh, but yeah, so that's what happened. I thought that that was going to become a new thing and it didn't take off. Uh, so then I said, well, uh, I said, listen, Pitter Patter, sit down. We got to talk. Uh, I said, Patter, uh, I think you're oh, going to be okay, Patter, because you, you just say you're a back patter. You're pa- patting people on the back. You you actually have some other usages uh, out there in the world. You just you, we you just have to keep. A, here's what I need you to do, Patter. Start monitoring the global usage of your word. And write a gratitude journal. And anytime someone says back patter or patterer, or they say back patting, maybe we could start to, you know, expand it a little. But I think you're, you've got more usage than we know. So why don't you keep a gratitude journal every night of your extra usages? Uh, and I'll get back to you. Pitter. Oh boy. I've thought about this because I didn't want to let either one of you down. But I said, Pitter, you never, I don't know if you, you're, you're, you, you get usage, uh, or used, uh, other than like, uh, I feel you. Come on in, come on in, come on in, Pitter. This is, by the way, Pat, not to get meta, but this is, uh, I don't know if this is the first time I've embraced a word on the air, but this is a really intimate moment. Come on in, Pitter. Uh, let me hold you here. Let me pat, you know, I do a sleep podcast, so that's why I'm good at, uh, Word snuggling. Yeah, come on in. Let me pat your back. I'll do, I can do some pitter and pattering. Where, where, where do you have the most tension? In the, in the, do you have two T's in your word? Because I can see those would probably gather a lot of tension. Well, listen, pitter, I have a plan uh, for you. So, like, I'm just going to, snu- okay, so yeah, come on, sit down next to me. Here's what I'm thinking. I'm going to start uh, spitting stone fruit. Uh, uh, see, I guess they're called seeds. I don't know. They're, you know, like apricots, uh, apricots, nectarines uh, are my favorite, plums. You know, they have polots and, and uh, they have a lot of new ones too. And the great thing about stone fruit is no one's, like with other fruit, they say, hey, get rid of those seeds. They get on my nerves. Uh, but I think stone fruit, the seeds are so big and they kind of give you a locus point and... People enjoy them, like sucking on them and spitting them. And I think there's a good chance we could make that a hobby, uh, pitting. And you say, I'm a pitter. And it might take a while, but, you know, every once in a while I do something that catches on. And they could just tell people, like, whew, I'm so relaxed just spitting these. Like, I'm just going to go to farmer's markets. We could hire some other people to go to farmer's markets. 
and we'll sit there and we'll we'll take the samples of the stone fruits and you know BYOST or whatever, but we'll bring our own stone fruits if we need to and we'll spit them into receptacles uh, or into fields uh how's how do you feel about that yeah i think it's exciting it's going to take some time but i can see you have patience cuz you really no offense you don't have any other options other than, other than toddlers and grandparents uh like, this way, it'll give you some independence better. I think you've wanted a life of your own for a while now, and I'm, I'm going to try and empower that. And, and you know, we're not going to leave Patter behind. Also, pretty soon, there's going to be tons of different pets, like, named Pitter and Patter. But, yeah, so then people say, Scoots, what are you doing? I say, I'm a Pitter. I won't say spitting pits. Uh, oh, boy, actually, that sounds pretty good. So, Pitter, hold on. I'm spitting pits. Uh, because I'm a pitter. Maybe I'll say I'm a pitter who spits pits. Uh, uh, I may say, I, I'm sorry, pitter. I may have to say, I'm, what are you doing? I'm, pit, I'm a pitter. I'm spitting pits. What does it look like I'm doing? We'll see. Uh, I think it'll be, I think it'll work out. I got to get back to the podcast. So pitter, excuse me. Sorry, folks. That was a little, like that was a tangent. I had to help out those words. And if you're new here, I would just posit that maybe that distracted you from whatever was keeping you awake. And, uh, you know, maybe by me comforting those words, uh, by pitter-pattering on their backs, uh, maybe it put you at ease and, and maybe you barely smiled. Maybe you fell asleep <laughs> or you said, hey, but I've had worse bedtimes than this. Uh, so give the podcast a few tries. I've been there. That's why I make this show, because I have issues sleeping and I have since I was a kid. So I really want to help you out. This is the only way. It doesn't work for everybody. Uh, give it a few tries. That's what everybody says. Uh, but I really hope it does help you out. Because uh, uh, I, I, I work very hard on this show. Uh, I yearn and I strive to help you fall asleep. Thanks again for coming by. Hey, this is Scoots. Before we get to the story, I just want to let you know... Uh, Again, Sleep With Me is going to be off until April 8th. Uh, we'll have a new episode Sunday, April 8th. Uh, we're moving the show to Night Vale Presents, but nothing is going to change on your end of how you consume the podcast. It'll be in the same podcasting app. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, what do you say we keep the show going? All right, I wanted to uh, read you uh, like a, a welcome to our ongoing series. Uh, it's untitled. Uh, and at this point, I don't think it'll get a title because, uh, but it's a story. Uh, if it had, if it, it does have a clear story, but you really got to like, a, it's more of a snoozy dreamlike story that you don't really need to listen to. And if you, if you want to listen to calm yourself down during the day, you'd say, well, I mean, yeah, you're right. It, it doesn't really, uh, but the facts are it's a, it's a young woman and a young girl that lives in a theme park and being raised by a theme park is really all the details. And uh, to transition you, I'm going to read uh, and quote and paraphrase from a Wikipedia article on conservatories, uh, the greenhouse type. So rest in, as they tell you, a conservatory is a building or a room that has a glass or tarpaulin I don't know how to say that word, actually, roofing, and walls used as a greenhouse or sunroom. Uh, if it was used in a residence, it might be attached to a house on only one side. Conservatories originated in the 16th century when wealthy landowners sought to cultivate citrus roots such as lemon and oranges uh, that began to appear on dinner tables brought from warmer regions in the Mediterranean. Municipal conservatories became popular in the 18th century. Many cities, especially those in close climate, cold climates with large European populations, have built municipal conservatories to display tropical plants and flower displays. Uh, this type of conservatory was popular in the early 19th century, and people were also giving them a social use, like tea parties. A conservatory architecture varies from Victorian glass houses to modern styles, such as geodesic domes. Uh, there are many large and impressive structures. Uh, in the UK, it has a legal definition. Conservatory is a building that has 50% of its side wall 
uh, glazed and 70%, 5% of its roof glazed with translucent materials, either polycarbonate sheeting or glass. Uh, today, the su- terms the sunroom, solarium, and conservatory are used interchangeably. Uh, but uh, the term conservatory, and particularly English conservatory, evoked the in- image of an ornate structure echoing the tradition of the eras of the uh, Victorian era of conservatory building, and they're built around the world. Uh, they started with preservation, as we said, of citrus fruits, tender plants. Uh, they started out being built uh, as, like, just crudely over uh, potted plants or beds, uh, removing plants indoors. Uh, known in Italy as the limon- limonia, limonia, uh, the early structures had wood panels in storerooms or open galleries. Uh, further north, uh, they wanted to preserve orange trees, uh, special purpose buildings to protect the tasty but delicate fruit. Orangeries, uh, as they became to be called, were uh, typically enclosed uh, in structures built with wood stone or tall vertical windows. And then they became uh, used to like a wider variety of plants used socially. Uh, greenhouses were rooms and conservatories were t- t- for tender plants. Uh, in the 18th century, a Dutch scientists pioneered the use of sloping glass to bring in more light for the plants than the tall, wide, uh, glass-sized uh, sidewalls of orangeries. Uh, but the 18th century was the golden age of conservatory building in England. Uh, they were the product of the love of gardening and new technology in glass and heating. And many of the magnificent public conservatories built of iron and glass are a result of this area, including Kew, Kew Gardens in London. And uh, for rare and tender plants, sometimes for birds and rare animals, uh, sometimes all living together. Uh, that stopped during WW2, but then with the insulated glass in the 50s and 60s, saw more simple sunroom structures. And then again in the 70s, people started to recreate the Victorian style of the 19th century. Uh, using insulated glass. Uh, contemporary construction of conservatory differs from an orangery and having 75% of its surface on the roof made of glass and uh, 50% of its walls. Uh, and contemporary ones use technologies to make sure the gla- energy is as efficient as possible, ma- letting in the maximum amount of light while maintaining a steady room temperature. Uh, they could include argon impregnated glass, heat reflective film, thermal ribbons, thermal breaks, or hollow sections of glass that in- intercept heat. So that's a little bit about conservatories. Ah, yes, when you arrived here with me, uh, it's good to tell your tale of how you came to me. You were very young, you spent some uh, very quality length of time. Uh, inside my walls, uh, under my roof, uh, not just inside, but outside too. And, uh, you know, I've been defined as the largest greenhouse or the largest conservatory in the world. Though some would argue that, uh, you know, because of the massive uh, amounts is spent, you know, that it was an unfair advantage because it was a uh, paid but I said people pay to go to municipal conservatories. And just because I'm an attraction uh, does not mean I'm just an attraction. But I, And this isn't an insult to conservatories. Uh, but I, we were also a research facility as well as a conservatory or greenhouse, whichever you're more comfortable with. Uh, I mean, I was always referred to, you know, as a... As a uh, as an attraction, I, you know, I've just been learning these things as I prepared to report back to you. And it was so, and I guess this is one of the technicalities when people said, well, he said it was so large that I was sectioned off internally. And so you could say that because the air was not free flowing between all my regions, uh, that it was compartmentalized in some places, uh, uh, which we, I guess for the guests, uh, there was uh, there had to be AC in guest areas uh, because otherwise I would be just too, too warm. And even for the plants, we had many ways to regulate the heat in the summer. 
Uh, because traditionally, uh, where we were located, where the park was, is not exactly an area that uh, has a lot of cold weather. So some would say the conservatory was just uh, for show. Uh, but as, you know, with the climate, uh, I became a protective place, believe it or not, uh, and uh, where plants really do, could flourish. And because we had programs for actual, both uh, researchers that were part of the company, but also university students uh, uh, coming and working and, and doing tests, uh, it was a very active and busy place, a very, and, and a real working uh, I guess you would say, you couldn't call me a farm. I don't know why you couldn't, I guess. But, uh, you know, so many of the vegetables in uh, the economy, they, they said, wow, we can actually produce uh, most of the greens, the salads, the microgreens. We could get them of the highest quality for the restaurants uh, if that would serve the guests, uh, the tablecloth restaurants, but also some of the non-tablecloth restaurants. Uh, and those were the first, of course, to close when as things began to change. And so they needed less and less vegetables. Uh, it's strange with the changing of the times, uh, people ate less vegetables. Uh, yeah, but I guess it's neither here nor there. I mean, it was uh, at it, 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 my boom time, I was producing the majority of vegetables. Uh, now, not all vegetables. Some had to be purchased and brought in. Uh, but you would have been impressed, and that's why I was. That was the vision the engineers had. Uh, and then there was another vision they had, which was a rebranding and a refurbishment for me, uh, because while my behind-the-scenes uh, business uh, was booming, the ability to grow plants uh, to for, for people to say, "Well, let's test this out. This is a perfect environment. It's a very uh, climate-controlled." And because I was able to filter the new light, you know, the light uh, a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, the plants were getting just the right amount of sunlight and not uh, overexposed to, to solar beams. And that was another reason why we flourished uh, so much in supplying the uh, the restaurant's food. But where I fell short, I guess, was on the guest uh, uh, you know, the guest satisfaction or the popularity. It was never the most popular. We had a boat ride through my greenhouses uh, or a greenhouse or conservatory. And, of course, from the outside, it was very impressive, like a nouveau Victoria. I don't know what they call it. Uh, uh, nouveau. They, 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 you know, the critics also were split on it. Uh, but a modernized Victorian structure you know, to give me a regal but modern look uh, uh, with my glass and uh, iron and all those things. Uh, so I looked very impressive. And I had some nice places to eat inside. Uh, but then the attraction, and then we had uh, like a show, a Tronix show, which towards the end went away. Uh, and it was about the food groups and then about, you know, eating your greens, uh, different electronics, uh, dancing and singing. But that was gone when you came. You would have never even known it was there. But that was not the main. So the refurbishment, they said, well, the, the guests don't like to just ride around and look at plants and hear explanations. Uh, except for the ones that really like it. But that was a small percentage. And so people would sleep on my boat ride. Or they would go to, uh, get, get, it, interestingly enough, escape the heat uh, from the weather inside a greenhouse, which was, uh, it depended on the AC. And, you know, that would make it uh, not super tolerable for you, but you were already adjusted to the heat, so you didn't really mind. And you had designed ways to cross breeze things. Uh, and also, well, we'll see. We'll get to you, well, your involvement. But they did a refurb and made me into a biosphere, by name only, a fictional biosphere. I went from the largest conservatory conservatory in the world to being a uh, fake biosphere. So they could tell the story of three families that volunteered. And that, but this was essential in your development, so I guess it was a good thing. I was frustrated. I said, what am I, not good enough? Uh, 
I have to have a story, of course. All these engineers and the story makers, or whatever they're called. And they said it'll be the tale of these three families, and, and it won't be a conservatory anymore. It'll be a biosphere modeled for, to, to start on other planets into testing out technology that could be used. Uh, and I guess they said, he said, wow, they did have foresight. We didn't end up on any other planets other than fictionally. Uh, but anybody that had a biosphere with its own cooling was in great, would have been in great shape. Uh, but I was not a sealed bio. I mean, I was mostly sealed bio. But, you know, I wasn't designed as a biosphere. You go in and you stay in and everything is self-contained is the story. And that is actually what a biosphere is, I believe. You know, sealed off from the world. Uh, this family was volunteering uh, for some time, uh, an unspecified amount of time, longer than a year. Uh, and the children were various ages so that the story could also not reflect just plants, but the children could relate uh, to the three different families, three different families from around the world, too. And they could introduce the diversity of both their cultures and of their uh, fruits and vegetables and of the planting, you know, the modernization of planting. And they said that'll get guests interested in plants. They love technology and stories. But I, and I think they, you know, some of these engineers, the story engineers or whatever they call them, is they were really involved. They said, okay. Let's really follow these children more than the adults. They're more interesting. And they engage with plants and, and vegetables in a different way. And so it'll be interesting. And let's watch them grow up throughout the ride. And what what, what, what could be better fate-wise for you? And you had a lot to learn when you got here. So thank goodness for these wild ideas that the engineers had. Uh, and also it was just strange when you arrival because I was in need of some care if I was to be anything other than, because when you came, I was a, 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 mostly an empty shell other than the biosphere story. You know, most of my plants, uh, people had taken, you know, employees, they said, just take the rest of the plants home and see what you could do with them. So some of my facilities were left, uh, some things were taken my canal was drained, uh, so I had no more canal for boats to travel on. I just had the families. Uh, and again, I guess they they, uh, they really did a good job, uh, you know, making, like on these refurbs, the quality of the technology was so simple. A lot of it, uh, you know, they were doing cost savings, but using technology in a unique way. So, yeah, but as, this, as things this slowed down, so did my use, and so did the researchers stopped researching. And then, you know, restaurants just stopped serving microgreens and micro carrots and all those things. Uh, uh, so I was glad you were here as well. And, of course, before you got here, the caretaker had come and made sure all my bulbs were fixed and uh, that some of my fans were working. Well, we don't have AC anymore. We did have some fans to circulate the air. And then you got there, and you couldn't really speak. You could make uh, noises. Uh, and I know you could listen, because uh, I had heard about you with your mother goose and, and, and interacting with those characters. Uh, so words kind of called to you. So as you found the triggers for the ride, and some of the ride elements were designed to, once to be triggered in the start of the day and the close of the day. So once you figured out those triggers, which were easy for you, uh, you were called to the characters uh, uh, in the story, to the families, to the children. And their words, uh, but because my, you wanted to ride in my boat canal, but you couldn't figure out how to turn it on. Uh, so you just walked around along the banks of the canal, and you, at first you followed the whole story. But then uh, you, the whole story, I think they were called the Biosphere Bunch, uh, and that name never took off. Uh, but every once in a while they'd say, oh, here we are with the Biosphere Bunch. Maybe that was what the kids called it. They had the little... Uh, 
because they had a tree house, but we'll come to that. But yeah, you had these fictional three families sealed in the biosphere uh, to live together. And it didn't really make a big difference to you. You just said, hmm, who are these children? And, and the first thing you noticed was uh, one of the first scenes with the family, which was a natural, uh, again, I guess I'm struck, uh, that some of the children were getting bedtime stories. Uh, they all slept in a dormitory together, and they were new, and they were they were getting to know one another. And they were all different ages, though some of them were close in age, so they could be friends. And so they had this scene in the dormitory where the children were adjusting to life in the biosphere, and they were getting read bedtime stories. And there were three different stories going on with uh, a sibling and two different parental figures uh, reading to different children, groups of children. And different stories. Uh, now, they did all, at one time, the Geneas did have it in three different languages. Uh, but because, it, I, I don't know, there was a whole argument about that and uh, about the volumes of the three different stories. Uh, but so the, at this time, they were in English. This was like a, a version 2.1 or something. But because of the technology at the time, the affordability, the, the books were... Uh, both not real and real. They were projected books. Uh, so uh, three different beds, uh, there was someone sitting with a book in their lap, which was just a blank. Uh, it looked like a book, but it was really just a screen. And projected on it was the story. And because of the like digital technology, uh, they, 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 this was, again, a battle of the Geneas. This was like when the budgets were still, when the money was flowing. And the Geneva behind this ride said, let's have, a, like, a really, like, a, so this rewrite ability, a cookie level. There was a, thousands of hours of stories between these three uh, storytellers, readers, and they were actually reading, and the, the text was going on, being projected onto the page as they were reading it. I mean, of course, it was just an MP3 file, like a digital file of their audio, and you were able to sit there. You now, the beds weren't really mattresses, uh, but you did your own. kind, of, And you even moved the children out of the beds, uh, which I thought was funny. And you would get in there, and you would first just listen to the stories for comfort every few hours. Uh, and then at nighttime, and you would sleep in there. Uh, you had to bring your own—you had to eventually find a mattress uh, and bring it in. And if, if, as nights and nights wore on, uh, you know, the stories, because you could start them and stop them. You didn't, now, you didn't have control over skipping them, but they just advanced uh, in a tiered way through the thousand hours. So, you know, you could repeat a story with a different parental figure uh, like a day or two later. I think I, I can't remember how the loops were figured. But there was so much for you to read, and they were reading simple children's books. Uh, and then one of the, the older siblings was reading a little bit more of a, you know, like a reader, early reader, I think they called them. And so eventually you were able to sit along in the parents' lap uh, and read along with them. And I'm sure, I don't know if you imagined it, like uh, what the relationship was. Uh, to be honest, you seem more interested in the uh, the stories and the words uh, and the sounds all coming together for you. I think your brain was really grasping it and processing it uh, and following along with them. Just a weird quirk of technology, uh, more than your relationship with these, because they were static uh, figures. They were more statues. Uh, the projection technology was what gave the motion. Uh, but one thing you also started to notice with the stories was that it, many, as many as possible were about plants and growth and germination. And uh, that was what the next scene with the family was, like actual in front of the working greenhouses. Uh, and the scene was uh, the children learning about germination and how a seed first germinates. And you did seem fixated on that as well. Uh, and because of, again, the technology, it said, oh, wow, uh, 
This is, it was like an understanding clicked in you. Because then they had videos about germination and then that's the first stage of growth. And this is where you started to test because uh, you found the seed, the seed vaults. uh, And I guess, I don't know, you know, the playful hand of the caretaker interrupting your nat. I guess, uh, caring for you and taking care. You found the seed vault uh, in the door. You know, you didn't have to worry about it being locked, uh, though it had been closed for a long time. So the seeds were intact in the seed vault. And the seed vault was very symbol-based. Uh, so all the seeds were both labeled with words and symbols. And this was perfect for where you were at. And the caretaker had been supplying you with some vegetables for food. Uh but I think they had a vision for you. And so you would take seeds and you would take water and you were trying to germinate the seeds. And because it was kind of warm, uh, the seeds would start to germinate, but then they wouldn't grow because one thing that I was lacking, even as a conservatory, was light. Uh, and we hadn't talked about that, but that was because over the years... Uh, there's so much debris and algae and mud had covered up all of my windows. Uh, so without artificial light, it was very, very dark and sad. No natural light coming in. And we didn't have plant lights, uh, really. Uh, that was the whole purpose of a conservatory, was uh, that there was natural light coming in. And uh, you, you figured it out, you know, just by watching the videos and... You also discovered that our our our, our uh, gift shop, my gift shop, I guess, uh, was uh, also the largest library or bookstore. I guess it wasn't; it became a library for you. <laughs> uh, but also in the seed vault was also a lot of the the paper storage uh, because it was, it was so climate controlled and. and uh, so you had so many books to look through, and so many of them were about plants, but there were also books about other things. But you weren't really reading much at this point. You were more looking at pictures and trying to understand as each night you read along with the bedtime stories. And then it was this was a tough time, and I said, this caretaker, I don't get it, the caretaker, what the caretaker's up to. Because the caretaker had left out or prepared all the things for window washing. My windows had never been washed, but I said, why can't the caretaker do that? Uh, You're just a little kid. Well, you figured out. You looked at the sunlight. You went outside. You rubbed a a hole in the window. You tried to grow a plant just with a few windows uh, that you could clear out. uh, And then you saw the icons and the pictures for the window washing, which was, again, not word-based and instruction. It showed a person pushing the green button up, uh, the red button down, uh, which lines to pull on, even the soap distribution because it was right to the side of the little closet. Uh, Now, this one needed much more elbow grease because a lot of the rubber in the squeegees was no longer working. So you did have to scrub. And then you set forth and cleaned my windows, uh, or as many of them. You know, not like a sparkling, like opening day or anything like that. Uh, There was no waxing. But you washed off my windows, and that was over a long, long period of time. And you grew... And you actually seemed like you were becoming a better read. You were starting to read, maybe, or read along. Uh, because at some point, a lot of the stories started to be to their tiered looping. And so, uh, I don't know. And I said, how much time has gone by that she's washing these windows? Uh, and you had your little belt and you were clipped in. And I guess I started to get some pride. And then your light was in there. And you could create a seedling. And this was what was interesting. And I guess what was driving you was because then the children had grown. Uh, and the next stage of the biosphere was it, the children were then assigned to read to plants. Uh, and not just a germinating plant, but the seedling, the growing plants. Uh, and you would read, watch and read more with the children, read along with them. 
But you would also watch, they had a very complicated projection illusion to show a plant going from germination uh, to a seedling to budding and flowering. And, you know, the adults explaining these things and making it as, as interesting as they could. But then you got to sit with the children as they sound, I couldn't, couldn't believe this, uh, they were reading, some of the children, you know, they had all the different ages, but that was one of the children's jobs. Uh, and it was a trick that they explained. The adults said, well, this is a way to weave work and school into one because the plants need attention. And then they even showed how it would be broadcast to the moon base uh, and the biosphere there. And to the plants on the moon base, it didn't have children to read to the plants on the moon base. Uh, but, you know, th that it has a real effect to possibly on plants, but also the children needed to, to have their reading time. So some of the older children were doing quiet reading and some of the younger children were sounding out. And there was even one a teen to help them while they sounded things out and they were learning. And then you were sounding words out with the children and then actually pulling books and trying to do it on your own. Now, that was very frustrating for you because you didn't have a fictional or real adult figure to help you. You had to learn, and you would slam the books closed sometimes. Uh, and the children, you know, it was uh, acting, so it wasn't like they were actually struggling to read like you were, to understand uh, the sounds and the letters uh, and to create a, like a picture vocabulary in your mind. But you did have picture dictionaries, which were nice. Uh, and that was a good way to learn. But it was not easy. No, no, no. And I think your frustration also stemmed from the fact that you couldn't, you couldn't get a seedling to take because you had the sandy soil you were just bringing in from the outside. And it had kind of been depleted as the grasses had it depleted the soil. Uh, uh, where they just had, you know, to, to make the spots of the park look very presentable. And you, you, then you heard, uh, like, uh, the next presentation where the adults were talking about the nutrients and nutrient film and how they at the biosphere had a closed system, which we did not have. That was fictional, where even the methane was generating power, but they closed a system of, gray, you know, all the waters, the gray and the non-gray waters, uh, using that to help create the nutrients for the plants uh, with also the other things they were eating. But you didn't have that closed system. You looked for it, uh, but it was fictional and projected. And you grew very, very frustrated. And any of the supplies like that on the inside had been gone. As people kind of said, as the worker said, well, I'll just take this home. I want to grow my own food at home. And eventually you would go, you, you know, also because the temperature was so fluctuating inside, sometimes you would go outside or if it was raining or, the, you know, the weather had changed. Uh, and you discovered behind, out behind my conservatory these big mounds uh, and this is where the words clicked, everything clicked for you on these great mounds. If you only knew what was underneath the mounds, uh, but eventually you did. As you lied in them, and this was spring, and the clover and the vetch uh, were flowering. And at one point you were lying there looking at it. Uh, I think you're cooling down from a frustration from reading and you realize cl cl clover v v from your books, and you ran and got the book, and you looked at the pictures of the clover and the vetch, and you kind of sound those words out, so you had a joy from that, and you realized uh, uh, that that was being talked about in the same place where plants were growing, and it, it was a book about compost, compost for kids it was called, and you started digging, uh, and... Uh, this compost had been there for a long, long time. And it was a very professionally made compost from all of the restaurants at the park. As I said, they could harvest so many things that were vital to compost. Uh, you know, different meals, uh, you know, not people's meals, but yes, like, uh, and different organics and coffee grounds and nitrogen fixing plants and me like oh meals I guess I already said fish you know from the fish and from the 
land animals. Uh, there was stuff from the zoos and the stables in there. And it all, now it didn't need to be mixed. Uh, so it took you a while again, but you had the time to experiment. And eventually that was a lot of work for you turning over one of these giant mounds, uh, in the layers of compost. But as you did, it, this was rich, rich and mixed with sandy soil. Oh, when you started planting in that, uh, uh, things really took off, just like in the image. And then you moved on. Uh, your reading was still coming along slowly. But the next uh, scene with the family and the children was the one that returned to the future. The future returns to the past, one of the adults explained, in the one-room schoolhouse where the older chi you know, the children had grown too. And the older children and the, uh, a couple of the adults, uh, you know, the children were trying to teach each other, teach themselves, and learn from one or two adult figures. And again, this was mostly fixated on reading this whole ride, my attraction, the storyline. Uh, they didn't have any arithmetic, luckily, because I'm not a fan of that. I guess I am a fan of it, but... Uh, and so you would be in the schoolhouse again, learning deeper, and then having your own physical books, too, and seeing the phonics and the coding, decoding or whatever the children do, and even some writing, watching them write. And again, I guess these projections, uh, they had so much material they could use. Because uh, he said, what if a guest is, sits on the ride for three hours in a row? I want everything to be different, the engineer said. But also at this time, you had started to, you know, your reading was growing. Your curiosity was growing about what more I had. And you found some of the growing rooms, like vertical planters and horizontal drip irrigation planters. And they were in fairly deep disuse, uh, so you were taking it apart and looking at it, and, you know, you were physically watering your plants and still learning about watering properly. And you saw many of the the rides explaining the power of the vertical planters, or what you were like, well, which works with compost in the drip irrigation and then you even found, eventually, you got into one of the control panels for the drip irrigation system. And decoding that took a very long time because it was full of diagrams and, and you could just jog in, uh, some of which you had just had to experiment. Plus, you had to scale it down because this was for a whole giant grow house. Uh, and you really didn't need to grow that much. And you were already having some success in beginning to grow your own uh, greens, uh, and then tomatoes, and then cucumbers, uh, but it was a lot of work, and you had, you know, you had books to read, and, you know, you were becoming, uh, uh, going from a uh, child to a, I don't know what, what they call it, uh, your stages of growth were staging on, and you were in the schoolhouse pretending and I think because this was not as hard as some of the other attractions for you, because of the plants, uh, you were able to uh, project and invest some of that energy into the plants, and you were able to talk to the plants, and you knew they were living, unlike the attraction, which was uh, an illusion of living and a fiction of biosphering. Uh, I think the plants gave you a connection uh, that you needed, uh, that they were more than just sustaining you. It wasn't really, you know, it's, it's not easy for you uh, being a child. It's, it's, you know, we were doing our best, uh, I guess, giving you the channel. I mean, for me, I was lucky that the refurbishment happened because I couldn't teach you to read. Only you could, and I don't know if you could have taught yourself uh, with nothing else, uh, uh, but the ride, uh, the attraction, the biospherins, the biosphere bunch was able, you were able to, it was, uh, yes, it was a quirk of matter, as the doctor says. And eventually you got uh, the uh, drip irrigation system working in a limited way. And you were also tempted to fill my canal, but as you learned more about water conservation, you said, well, I guess I'll go without the boat, uh, because, uh, 
you know, the like, I mean, it, the, the water situation had changed uh, because of where we were located. Uh, we were one of the spots that had plenty of fresh water, but it was good you were conserving and rotating the compost and then learning these systems as as you could read more and more, you know, and your curiosity would fill in the gaps uh, by, you know, cleaning pipes, attaching things, uh, what you couldn't read or understand. Your mechanical mind was able to uncover. Uh, you were able to nearly automate, uh, you know, some of the process, you know, that, that, that eventually... And so much of your uh, understanding of the language uh, was tied to books uh, and stories around uh, the growth of plants. It must have been a bit, bit stale. I mean, I know you started reading the uh, the travel guide sections and the trivia books and then the, 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 the lore of the characters in the park books. Uh, and then there was even pop fiction, some of it, you know, you, you were able to read some of that very, uh, and luckily there was a lot there. Uh, uh, so you were able to have plenty to read, uh, and it became a part of your routine, your nighttime routine of reading and winding down to relax, uh, and always reading to a plant for a little bit while until you got tired. It was the cutest thing I've ever seen. But those were the plants you took with you to the next, uh, you know, the other attractions uh, that you kept in your bag, that you kept hidden away. But you, I couldn't believe yes, you, you got it to the point where it needed minimal supervision. And then the caretaker would sneak in too, uh, uh, because the caretaker was mostly doing all of this on their own, uh, on their own homestead, where, wherever it was. Uh, but you had restored me, um, uh, not to my former glory, but to a place where uh, if fictional children were learning, real, a real child was learning, and plants were growing and flourishing again. And then you also tried to start growing the citrus and the oranges, uh, and that took a lot of patience and, uh, and years of uh, paying attention to it as you grew, they grew. Uh, but, uh, you know, so the vegetables uh, the, and then the fish uh, eventually would, uh, you know, the, the, the caretaker already had that taken care of, but eventually you were to take that over too. And I wonder what the researchers would have said if they could came now and said, uh, oh, if these were the conditions... Uh, how much would they doubt you in your ability to adjust? Uh, or would they celebrate you? You know what I mean? I, I, I have such excitement around it all. And such pride in watching you every night, reading to plants. as uh, it's Like I had a purpose that was fulfilled. That, uh, these, uh, I, I don't mean to judge uh, the refurbishment in the fictional family. But to have you in a real family with plants, uh, and to have you like going through these stages uh, with with the language of germination, of being a seedling, a reedling, I guess we could have called you, my little reedling, and then budding and flowering, as you would later uh, after you left me physically, that would be at some point. But this was more your relationship with the language budding and flowering and getting close. And then, you know, the, that part of you that needed that connection, uh, at least making some of it with the plant, at least rejecting some intimacy onto and into the plants and actually maybe having some real, because these were real living beings, uh, uh, that you were connected with, that you were responsible for, and that you were maintaining. And, and sometimes you couldn't maintain it, but you were constantly, I don't know what else it awakened in you. Uh, met I mean, it couldn't, it's not even a metaphor, even though it is a perfect metaphor, that it started to grow in you. Uh, this deeper engagement with your your curiosity and you're st I mean, I can't believe you cleaned my windows. I, most children 
wouldn't be allowed to do that at all. It'd be like saying, hey, go drive a car now after you clean the windows on a window washing rig. But you didn't know that. You said, oh, this is necessary. Let it be done. Let me get to work here. And so I guess as you left, I was just struck by how honored I was to be a part of it, uh, to be here and uh, to observe you. You know, I, I, you know, I had pride in my size, but it was the small things. And I was lucky that my bookstore, my gift shop, uh, I guess because of the niching, they said, oh, well, for a long time, the only people that would ride my attraction were tired people, people that didn't want to wait in line because there was never a line and people that loved plants. So they said, well, let's sell a lot of books to these plant lovers. And so uh, that's a big part of my history. And so, yes, uh, you know, I, I, I never had was able to rock you to sleep in my canal, in my boat, like others were. But uh, I was able to watch you go through those stages and to guide others through those stages of germination, of growth, of uh, organic matter of phosphorus and nitrogen potassium you know of watering and then of a drip drip dripping the water out as it's needed uh and then maturing and ripening and then delivering sustenance uh and also, you did that with the language. It enabled you, enabled you to engage so much more deeper with me and the other attractions. And it gave you another tool uh, uh, to, to, to keep your journey going. And so I guess I, uh, that's how I remember it. Uh, and it's unforgettable. And uh, I forgot how the rest of you know, it's just like a, the, the story of the bio... Syrians, uh, it, it didn't really have it. Like they said, well, then the children learned. It was mostly following the children. And then them grow, they skipped a portion from, uh, they skipped the teen portion mostly. And then the children were uh, recommitting to the biosphere, and some of them had to become in relationships and, and uh, start their own families. They said, isn't it convenient that Janiers skipped over that but the middle part there? And yes, and they say, well, oh, next to Mars and Venus and all those things. Uh, but I was happy just with you here, bringing the earth into me in the water, in the language. Uh, I'm honored. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank everybody on Patreon, Ava, Matt, and Jessica. Thanks, thanks, and good night. Melissa, Pamela, and Diane. Thanks, thanks, and good night. Susan, uh, Dustin, and Laura K. Thank you, thanks, and good night. Emily, Dennis, and Jenny. Uh, thanks, thanks, and good night. Kiss, uh, Jordan, and Claudia. Thank you, thanks, and good night. Uh, Sherry, Andy, and Richard. Thank you, thanks, and good night. Uh, Luke, Alex, and Noel, thank you, thanks, and good night, or Noel. Uh, Andrew, Greg, and Allie, thank you, thanks, and good night. Uh, Tim, Wayne, and Bev, uh, thank you, thanks, and good night. Uh, Diana, Adam, and Kim, thank you, thanks, and good night. Uh, Elliot, uh, Serena, and John, thank you, thanks, and good night. Uh, Alex, uh, Susan, and Janice, thank you, thanks, and good night. Uh, Chris, John, and Aaron, thank you, thanks, and good night. Sophia with an F, uh, Cassie and Thomas, uh, thank you, thanks, and good night. Uh, Jennifer P., uh, Nicholas, and Kaylin, thank you, thanks, and good night. Uh, uh, Joseph, Jeff with a J, with a, spelled like with Jeff with a G, and Sudi, thank you, thank you, and thanks, and good night. Uh, Kara with a C, Angela and Riley, thank you, thanks, and good night. Megan uh, uh, A, uh, Karen K, and Mike, uh, thank you, thanks, and good night. Uh, Jenny, James, and Derek, thank you, thanks, and good night. Brian D., James, and Andrea, thank you, thanks, and good night. Letitia, 
Amber and Jennifer, thanks, thanks, and good night. Uh, Grant, Kate, and Jordan, thank you, thanks, and good night. Uh, Claire, Becca, and Kelly, thank you, thanks, and good night. Uh, Kristen, Baluska, and Aaron, thanks, thanks, and good night. Alexandria, uh, Carrie, thank you, thanks, and good night. And Sean, and M. M. Boyt, uh, or Bolt, Boy, Bolt, I can't see my, I need glasses, uh, uh, but MB, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Good night. Thanks, everybody, for supporting the show. Uh, if you want to support the show on Patreon, go to slash patron. And uh, good night.